The next topic is clinical and radiological classification of intracerebral hemorrhage. When we have sick patients with neurological conditions, we're used to using clinical grading scales. For traumatic brain injury, the use of the Glasgow Coma Scale is standard. Hopefully, all patients with acute ischemic stroke are assessed using the NI stroke scale. For subarachnoid hemorrhage, we use the Hunt Hess or World Federation of Neurological Surgeons scale. And for arteriovenous malformations, we're used to the Spetzler Martin scale. But one of the problems with ICH is there hasn't been a standard uniform scale used across all patients. And so this has really made it difficult to understand what we're talking about when we see that acute patient. This is from the American Heart Association ICH guidelines, and they now recommend that a baseline severity score should be performed as part of the initial evaluation of patients with ICH. And we'll talk in a moment about the ICH score, which is the most commonly used ICH severity score. Also recognize that rapid neuroimaging is key using CT or MRI to distinguish ischemic stroke from ICH. In fact, we really can't tell clinically whether a patient is having an ischemic stroke or an ICH until they get a CAT scan. MRI scan can also be utilized, but practically speaking, CT scanning is usually more widely available and is easier to perform in critically ill patients. The guidelines also recognize that the use of CT angiography or MRI may be useful, and we'll talk a little bit about that as well. The ICH score, as I mentioned, is a baseline severity score that allows us to do a classification of patients so we can communicate appropriately, understand how sick is our ICH patient. It's comprised of five different particular uh, subcomponents, which all are uh, associated with outcome. The Glasgow Coma Scale score, hematoma volume, the presence of interventricular hemorrhage, whether the hematoma starts in the infratentorial region, and elderly age. And so you take each of these components, for example, the GCS score, do the GCS score and assign points on the ICH score. If the hematoma is greater than or equal to 30 cc's, they get a point. If there is interventricular hemorrhage, they get a point and so on. Add up all the points and the total ICH score ranges from zero to six. And the ICH score has been demonstrated to be associated with increased risk of mortality. So a higher ICH score is associated with an increased risk of the patient's gonna die and a lower likelihood that they're going to recover to independent function. I wanna emphasize something that's very, very important though. One of the problems with using any score such as this is people focus too much on a specific number. And I've seen patients say, well, the ICH score is four, therefore they have a 96% risk of mortality. And that's really not how we should be using these. We should be using these to say, well, a four is worse than a three is worse than a two. But there is inherent uncertainty around the exact point estimates. And if you take a patient with an ICH score of three and you say, well, this is bad, we're not going to treat them aggressively, then they're probably not gonna do well. So don't allow the use of this to convince you to not treat aggressively. Allow the use of this to help you communicate properly and focus on the optimal treatments for patients. So the ICH score is going to be recommended as the baseline severity score that you should probably be doing on these patients. What about neuroimaging? Well, there are a number of different characteristics of the CAT scan findings. They're really very helpful in the ICH patient. Location, hematoma volume, interventricular hemorrhage, what we're gonna call the spot sign, and then other findings such as mass effect, herniation, or presence of something you think maybe there's an underlying tumor or a vascular malformation. Location is the number one important thing to recognize from the CAT scan. And so these are the typical locations for ICH. 
basal ganglia, thalamus, lobar location, cerebellum, and pons. ICH can occur in other locations, but these are really the most common far and away. And these can be divided into supratentorial and infratentorial locations. And that's a component of the ICH score. These patients in the infratentorial hemorrhage would get a point on the ICH score. The other reason this is very important is there are certain areas that are very typical locations for hypertension as a cause because the deep penetrating arteries are injured by chronic hypertension for the basal ganglia, thalamus, cerebellum, and pons. If you see a low bar location, that tends to not be hypertension, but raises the suspicion for another cause, like amyloid, coagulopathy, sympathomimetic drugs of abuse, or something like that. We've known for a very long time that the larger the hemorrhage is, the lower the likelihood of favorable outcome. And this is a fairly old slide, 23 years old, from one of the early publications that looked at this. And this is outcome on a particular type of scale. We don't use this scale, the Oxford Handicap Scale, very much. We tend to use a scale called the Modified Rankin Scale, and I'll show you some examples of that later. But you see, as the hematomas get bigger, the likelihood of favorable outcome decreases. Now that's not to say that's perfect. There are patients here who died who have smaller hematomas. So it depends on where it is as well. A smaller hematoma in the brainstem can be very, very bad. But overall, being able to calculate hematoma volume is very useful, and it's a component of the ICH score. <clears throat> so how do you calculate hematoma volume? Well, you need to look at your CAT scan, or I guess MRI scan, but CAT scan's fine. And one way to do it is to use a computerized algorithm. And you can use this on a digital imaging algorithm by using, by using computerized planimetric analysis. You draw a line around the hemorrhage slice on each slice, and then you integrate this across this. But I gotta be honest, that's kind of complicated. And everybody doesn't necessarily have this. But what I suspect everybody in the audience did is take trigonometry at some time in their education. And so you can actually use what's called ABC over two, that formula, to estimate the volume of a spheroid. So let's do that right now and I'll show you how easy it is. And then you can do it on. <coughs> this is that CAT scan from our patient. What you do is you take the largest CAT scan slice, the slice with the most hemorrhage on it, just by eyeball method, and take A, which is the longest axis, measure it in centimeters, and take B, which is the longest axis perpendicular to that, and then C is the number of slices that you see hemorrhage on times the slice thickness. Now remember, down here, we see, if it looks like there's not that much hemorrhage, don't count it. If there's moderate hemorrhage, you count it as half a slice on the C axis. And if it's greater than 75%, you count it as a full slice. So how would this work out? Let's say A is four centimeters and B is three centimeters. And let's say that we're using half centimeter slices on our CAT scan and you see it on 10 slices, the way we calculate this. So A is four times three is 12, and C would be five, five centimeters, 10 slices times half a centimeter. So four times three is 12, by five is 60. Divide that by two, that's a 30 cc hemorrhage. Practice this on your own. This is something you should do and you should be able to do on your own. You don't need a radiologist for this. But if you are a radiologist, you ought to be reporting this out on all your ICH CATs. CATs. Interventricular hemorrhage is an independent predictor of worsened outcome, and it can lead to hydrocephalus and the need for a ventriculostomy or a ventricular peritoneal shunt. <clears throat> it may also injure the brain because of blood toxicity. I mentioned something called the spot sign, and this is a relatively new approach. See, for patients who come in with acute ischemic stroke, 
we're now giving contrast and looking at CT angiography. And this is pretty common to look for a large vessel occlusion. But a number of groups said, let's give contrast to ICH patients and see what we find. And it turns out that contrast extravasation into the hematoma is a very strong predictor of a hematoma getting bigger. How does this look like? Well, here is a patient with a left temporal lobar intracerebral hemorrhage. And here's the same scan post contrast. It's got these white dots in it. This is contrast extravasation. This is called the spot sign. And it turns out that that's a strong predictor, as we said, of worsened outcome and the hematoma getting bigger. There was, in fact, a study done called PREDICT, where a group tried to look at this in a large number of patients prospectively. And they found that in patients who had a spot sign, about 60% or three out of five patients had hematoma expansion. And among patients who didn't have a spot sign, about four out of five had no hematoma expansion. <laughs> So the spot sign's not perfect, but it is a strong predictor. Now, right now, we don't have specific targeted treatments, such as coagulopathy uh, treatments or uh, antifibrinolytics that have shown benefit for patients. But knowing a spot sign can help us be on high alert for a patient who's likely to worsen, and it's forming the basis for a number of ongoing research studies for new treatments.